Right, this lecture is about syllabification. And unlike most of the other lectures you've had, this one is controversial. And I'm putting forward my view of a subject, very much aware that my view is different from views held by many other people. So I'm arguing for a particular point of view. In discussing syllabification, we're asking how do we break a word up into syllables? A syllable in phonetics is a group of sounds that are pronounced together. And it's clear that languages differ very much one from another in how they treat phonetic syllables. Let me just emphasize phonetic syllables. I'm here not talking about spelling. I'm not talking about orthography. I'm not talking about how, how you write things down or how you break a word at the end of lines, for example. That's a different topic. I'm talking about pronunciation and uh, what evidence there is, if any, that we break things up in speech in some similarly organized way. Now, I say it's something that varies from language to language. As we put it, it's language specific. But I want to start by just referring to two languages where it's very clear the rules are different from what they are in English. First of all, some examples from Spanish. Now, I've written these in orthography, let's underline it, and in phonetic transcription, breaking the phonetic transcription Spanish up into syllables. If we've got the words in Spanish, Juan y Pepe, two names of people, you will notice that what happens when one says it in Spanish, by general agreement, is Juan y Pepe, that is that we transfer the N of Juan to the syllable with E to make Juan y, rather than saying Juan y. And indeed, English learners of Spanish have to be told to do this, otherwise they're going to do it wrong. <coughs> Similarly with the next example, which is gel y vinagre. When these come together, they come out as gel y vinagre. And again, we get the L transferred to the vowel. Spanish vowels, when they come together, typically compress in a way rather similar to English compression. Blanco y negro gives us blanco y negro. And again, English learners have to be told to do this because otherwise we won't. We'll say blanco y negro. And that's not as good in Spanish pronunciation. Coming together is good. Similarly, canta y habla become canta y habla. And you get the same effect. In French, Again, we find that word boundaries tend to be ignored in syllabification in speech. So if we take this standard example, which is the name of the United States in French, three words, les, liaison les, états unis, but one doesn't pronounce it as les états unis. No, it's les états unis. So if we rearrange everything in both of these languages, to get consonants into initial positions whenever possible. <coughs> As this is sometimes put, these are languages which involve the maximization of codas. Uh, not onsets, onset maximization. If we have syllables, Linguists nowadays divide them into onset and rhyme. And the rhyme, in turn, consists of a nucleus and a coda. And the problem always about consonants that occur between vowels is to know whether they're treated as codas, that's at the end of the syllable, or as onsets at the beginning of the syllable. It's clear that both Spanish and French tend to transfer what would otherwise be codas and make them into onsets. French de Frenet is transferred into the following syllable and becomes an onset. Now, it's clear that the Germanic languages in general, and English in particular, don't do this sort of thing. We tend
tend to preserve the integrity of words. Although we don't actually pause between words, obviously we don't, we run them together, nevertheless the phonetics is such that we can still recognize word final consonants as typically word final, and word initial consonants <coughs> as still typically word initial. If you look now at the handout, item number one on there concerns two different compounds, compound words in English, one a toe strap and the other a toe strap. Now, a toe strap is a strap for your toe. It's on a bicycle, a racing bicycle. On the pedals has a special strap to hold your <coughs> feet, your toes. That's called the toe strap. <coughs> if you make toast for breakfast and you place it in a container that holds each one upright, that's a rack, the result is a toast rack. If you look at the consonants involved between the vowels, you'll see that they're identical in each case. Yet, they don't sound identical. There is a difference phonetically between the sequence O strap out of toe strap and the sequence O strap out of toe strap. It's not a great difference, but it is there. And this then is evidence that we do respect these morpheme boundaries, that is the two parts of the compound word, or more generally word boundaries in speech. I remember my teacher of French phonetics telling someone that she wasn't satisfied they ought to uh, pronounce a nell in this word. Now she meant a sound L, but she didn't say an L, which is the English for that, she called it a nell. And we all heard this, you see, mm -hmm. uh, and it didn't make sense. And because the context actually wasn't sufficient to make it clear, there was a certain amount of confusion. She said a nell, and she should have said an L, and they don't sound quite the same. The N is stronger in a nell because it's at the beginning of a syllable, it's just a syllable. The N is much weaker in an L, where it's in fact in an unstressed syllable, it sounds at the end of a syllable. Uh, American structuralist linguists in the 1950s and 60s often discussed the difference in sound between a name and a name. And they do sound different. A name, a name, a name, a name. And if you can hear the difference, the N again is stronger in a name, a name, a name. It's weaker and almost tapped in a name, a name. We've got to have a name for the organization. We've got to have an aim for the organization. They mean different things. Mind you, I think if I were actually trying to communicate, I'd change um, this word to objective or goal or something, just to make, make it quite clear. But anyhow, they do sound different. So this is what we've got to take as our starting point, that civil boundaries are important in English. And the way they're important is that they trigger our poems. In other words, the N in name is subtly different from the N in tone, and the difference depends upon the fact that the N in name follows the syllable boundary. It's also a word boundary, of course. The N in name precedes this boundary. And so the rules for telling you the kind of N you use, the allophonic rules for N, are <coughs> sensitive to boundaries, to these word boundaries, and as I shall argue, to syllable boundaries. <coughs> uh, we perhaps uh, jump over one, two on the handout. Just look at one, three. Notice the rhythm, respectively, of shellfish, the kind of fish that have shells, shellfish, and selfish, greedy, concerned with oneself, selfish. Listen to them again. Shellfish, shellfish versus selfish, selfish. Do you hear the difference in rhythm? That's shellfish. That's selfish. What is this difference? Well, it's something that we've been telling you about, Lord <coughs> Rubber. It's the question of pre fortis clipping. Shell plus fish, kind of fish, is different from 
cell plus ish from cell because the f, what is consonant in fish, is in a different syllable from the f or sequence and so doesn't trigger prefortis clipping. Whereas the f in cellfish is in the same syllable, same morphism as the f or, and therefore does trigger prefortis clipping there. So we get more drawn out shell fish, to exaggerate it, versus clipped cell fish. I'm exaggerating, but the point is correct, and that's why they sound different. Well, this is quite straightforward. We know there are <coughs> morpheme boundaries. We know that shellfish is made up of shell plus fish. We know that cellfish is made up of cell plus ish. The interesting question then what is what happens when we have a similar sequence that is morphologically solid? doesn't consist of two parts in that way. <coughs> this is where the word dolphin comes in. Because that can't be broken into two parts. It's indivisible, like, say, tobacco or something. And so the question is, do we say dolphin, like shellfish, or do we say dolphin, like selfish? And the answer is clearly that we say dolphin. Dolphin. We don't say dolphin. And this is somewhat surprising, given the usual expectation that groups of consonants in the middle of a word will be divided, some going one way, some going the other. That doesn't seem to happen phonetically in dolphin, or I would argue in many other words. Uh, point one four on the handout are just two uh, a further well-known minimal pair that's often been discussed by Gimson, for example. He talks about the difference between a plum pie, a pie made of plums, plum pie, and a plum pie. I don't know why one would talk about a plum pie, <laughs> but uh, supposing you're a, a connoisseur of uh, eating sheep's heads, you might well have talked about a, a plum pie that you were going to eat. I don't know. Anyhow, phonetically, they're different. What are the differences? Plum pie. No preportis clipping of um. Compare plum pie. Yes, preportis clipping of um. The second P, that's the P in pi, is fully aspirated in plum pi. It's not fully aspirated in plum pi, because it's not syllable initial. Full aspiration is found only with syllable initial plosives. There's also probably some difference in the onset of the I diphthong plum pi, compare plum pi, where you want to build up to it, but you don't do and some more examples that people have often discussed in the literature, one five. Uh, highness, when we speak to royalty, we say, your highness, your royal highness, 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 we say it rather faster. Compared with the quality of being high, it's not the broadness that matters, but the highness. Mm. We have the word height, but we don't always use it. And there there is a difference because highness, in this sense, is rather longer. The I is rather longer than in the case of highness. We seem to signal that boundary there. Similarly, there's a difference between nitrate, the chemical, and the nitrate you pay on the telephone when it's cheaper at night. We actually call it an off-peak tariff nowadays in Britain, but it used to be known as the nitrate, and uh, it doesn't sound the same as nitrate, the chemical. Why not? Because nitrate, the chemical, has an Africa trip, like in tri or tree, whereas nitrate, <coughs> nit plus rate, doesn't, and he's likely to have glottalization of a T or even glottal replacement night rate. Well, all of those are some of the facts we need to start with. And the conclusion I come to is given in two on the handout that syllabification is phonologically relevant because certain segmental realization rules, for example, allophonic rules then, are sensitive to syllable boundaries. And what I've got here now is a quick list of some of the rules that are obviously sensitive to syllable boundary in this way. First of all, one we've already looked at, the aspiration rule. We talked about plum pi, but you see it very dramatically in the pair that I give here, a ease versus a tease. When soldiers are drilling, this is known as standing to attention, soldiers may get the command, stand at ease, and they have to move to this position. And this is called standing at ease. Someone who provokes someone else, who teases someone else, can be called a tease. He's a frightful tease. She's a terrible tease. 
Now, a tease has full aspiration of the T. A tease. Compared with, stand at ease. You don't get aspiration of the T. Indeed, Americans, some Brits, will voice that T. Stand at ease. Londoners may, may make it into a glottal stop. Stand at ease. <laughs> <coughs> stand at ease. Yes, but you don't get that with the initial T. A, a tease that we open up. So these differences in the possible realizations are clearly dependent on the syllable boundary. Notice that both at and a are what people sometimes call proclitic. That is, they are little words with no accent of their own, which tend to be joined onto the following word phonetically. Uh, so we might expect that would mean there'll be no difference, but that doesn't follow at all. Somewhat related, uh, the second line of this, T tapping, etc. Uh, this is with reference to the American voicing or tapping of T. Uh, might I say something? Might I, might I, Americans voice that T? Might I do it? Might I do it? So, so do we sometimes. But nobody voices the T in my tie. Even if we keep the rhythm the same because of the accents and the stresses and the intonation, nevertheless there's a difference. Might I do it? My tie is very nice. And they sound it. <laughs> Preport is clipping. At this time of year, you'll see the farmers reaping the corn. Reaping. Reaping. There we get Preport is clipping of E because of the P being in the same syllable. The syllables are reap and ing. They're not re and ping, as we can see by comparing a reprint. If something's been printed once and then we print it again, the result is a reprint. Where there's no preporter skipping of E, reprint. Compare reprint. So the rule for preporter skipping has to be formulated in a way that takes account of syllable boundaries, I would argue, and these syllable boundaries follow the rules I shall give you, which say that the P in reaping has to go with the first syllable, not with the second syllable. Otherwise, we should expect preport is clipping not to operate in reaping, yet it clearly does. Allophones of R, the allophony of the R phoneme. Uh, this is your rice. We've had a little discussion about this in connection with intrusive R, but the point is that even with intrusive R, it doesn't quite sound quite the same as an ordinary R. This is your rice, your rice, your rice, versus this is your ice, your ice, your ice. Now, the first one, this is your rice. It's the staple part of the meal. It's very filling. This is your ice. It's just water that's been frozen. Your rice, your ice. Now, people differ in exactly what they do between these two R's. Uh, the point is generally that the syllable initial R tends to be made more strongly than the syllable final one. With me, it's very obvious visually, because I have the habit, as many people do, of lip-rounding initial R. This is your rice, but not final R. This is your rice. So you can see that. People who use the tapped R, that uh, is now rather old-fashioned in RP, would say, this is your rice, with an ordinary R for rice, but this is your rice, using the tap for the linking R in the case of ice. Because those who do tap, typically tap, Silver so finally, which includes things like very sorry, but not so initial. <coughs> Plosive epenthesis. This is a habit that many people have of inserting a plosive between a nasal and a voiceless fricative, most obviously in NS sequences. So that where I would speak of a fence, many people will pronounce it. Fence, fence, fence. Where I'd go to a dance, many people would go to a dance. Where I'd say conscious, many people would say conscious. All right, this habit then of inserting a T here is called epenthesis. And the question is just what are the circumstances under which those who do it use epenthesis? And it's rather striking that they don't do it in words like inside. People don't say inside. Or the examples here, we've got fencing, where they do do it, and insight, where they don't do it. Why not? Well, clearly, insight, being made up out of in plus sight, 
the integrity of that morphological division is preserved phonetically so that we say inside the S remains in a different syllable from the N. Compare fencing, which is made up out of fence, nothing. The S is in the same syllable, so we get fencing. And indeed, to get a coherent account of close to sentences, I don't see any alternative to breaking the words up in the way that I'm arguing now they should be done into their syllables. <coughs> And the last one is sort of obvious, elision of T and D. Uh, first rate. You can elide the T in first rate. You can say it was a first rate play. First rate, first rate, first rate. You can elide that T because we can elide T in ST clusters before a following the consonant. But in mistrial, you can't elide the T because it's S followed by TR, and that's not the environment. <coughs> All of these examples, of course, arguably are dependent on the morphology rather than the syllables. It's the dolphin examples that lead me to argue that the syllables are going to parallel the morphology in any case. Whichever way around that is, we've noticed that in Spanish and in French, the morphology is overridden by the phonetics. So an important typological difference between English and Spanish, or English and French, is that in English, morphological boundaries are not overridden. And I think that's something probably shared with uh, most or all of the Germanic languages. Okay, well now, what do I conclude the English syllabification rule to be? Point three on the handout. I'm claiming that it's like this. Subject to certain conditions, consonants are syllabified with the most <coughs> strongly stressed of the two flanking syllables. This means that if we've got a word like happy, this P stands between the two syllables. The problem is which direction does it go? I say we have to decide by reference to stress levels. If this A is in a more strongly stressed syllable than the I, then the P goes to it. Consonants are attracted to stress, in other words. We are very used to this notion in the case of consonants where the following syllable is stressed. Everybody knows that in something like attack, the P goes in the second syllable, uh, of course, because the A is stressed. I'm arguing that it operates in the other direction as well, and the P in happy also goes into the stress. Well, this is supported by the examples we've got on the handout. First of all, packet. Now, packet sounds identical whether you read the single word packet as a packet of soap, or whether it's the verb pack plus the pronoun object it, packet. We've seen that in some of these other cases, we can hear a difference corresponding to a, morph to a morphological difference. Here, we can hear no difference. Therefore, it would seem the syllabification is such that the, it gives you the same result. The K goes with the first half of it. Um, if you don't like packet because you say this is derived from pack, well, you may replace it with the example picket and pick, but it's where exactly the same applies. And picket is certainly morphological solid. This means then in the words in the next line, I'm arguing for happy, as we've seen, the P in the first syllable. Party, the T I'm claiming must be in the first syllable. Ready, the D must be in the first syllable. What's the evidence for this? Party. Well, prefort is dipping again, you see. Does it affect the length of the R vowel? Yes, it does. We don't say party, we say party. Party, so prefort is clipping there, caused by the T. <coughs> Americans, of course, do they voice the T in that environment? Party, yes they do. So that's evidence for them that the same division applies. Americans also speed up the D in words like ready. They, that's how they say ready, ready, ready. In American English, we say ready. But the American speeding up or flapping of D operates in words like ready and is a typical syllable final process. I'm not sure how, how relevant this is to T 
teaching the pronunciation of English as a foreign language. But I hope to carry out some experiments if I can think of a way to do it. Uh, is it or is it not the case that uh, speakers of Spanish or French or Japanese can be helped by thinking of ready as being like red, the color, and then e, ready, rather than what their tendency otherwise would certainly be to think of it as re plus d. I'm arguing that English people analyze this unconsciously, implicitly, as red. <coughs> Just as yellow gives yellowy, blue gives bluey, red gives ready, well, we don't use the word, but we could do, uh, it would sound exactly the same as ready meaning prepare. Whereas English people never have syllables ending in air, so rep is a rather unnatural thing for us to try and say. Rep doesn't happen. Rep D is two unnatural things. So I'm arguing that that's what we do, and maybe it would have a practical application, maybe it wouldn't. Next examples on the handout. Typing, typing, you can see why they sound different. Typing, P causes preform is flipping, typing, it doesn't. Crisis, rising. Crisis, the I is clipped. Rising, it isn't, because the S, first S in crisis, is voiceless. The S spelling in rising corresponds to a voice. <coughs> there is a difference in three quarters clipping because one is voiceless, one's voiced. Therefore, they have to be in the same syllable as the I vowel in order to cause this to happen. Similarly, with hearty, clipped, hardy, no. Next uh, one, banker, someone who has a bank. Does he rhyme with anchor? Yes, he does. Anchor is morphologically solid, but the K there, there nevertheless must go with the air to cause the preport is flipping that we hear. Compare the word fan club, where you don't have the preport is flipping of the air from the letter. Note what happens when we add prefixes and suffixes that affect the stress. If we take the base note, what can we say about note? What can we say about the T there? Well, it's clearly final, it's a final T. And as such, it's not strongly aspirated. Note, they may have a, a bit of aspiration, but not strong aspiration. When we say notation, we add the suffix ation. One of the effects of the suffix ation is to cause stress to fall on itself. It therefore attracts the T of note into its own syllable. The T is now syllable initial, so we get strong aspiration. Notation, notation, notation. What happens on the other case, on, on the other hand, with annotate? Three syllable verbs in ATE typically get anticonultimate stress, so on the A. Annotate. Well now, this T, is it aspirated? Annotate. Yes, it is, somewhat strangely. Why is that? Well, because this is a very weak O, which usually goes to er, annotate. That normally does go to er, annotate. And the A, although it's not stressed in the sense that I would say stressed, it's still a strong vowel, not a reduced vowel. Some people would argue that it bears secondary stress or tertiary stress or something. Anyhow, that's clearly sufficient to cause the T to be in that final syllable and not to be with the rest of the note. The N has gone into the first syllable, the T goes to the last syllable, the note is dispersed among its surroundings, and therefore this T is initial and is still mm. aspirationally annotate. Look at the next example, too. Apply. ask me, why do we use this stress mark that's placed before the beginning of the syllable, instead of uh, writing it on top in a way that some people do say like that? And my answer tends to be that the stress marks show us something about syllable boundaries, and something very important about syllable boundaries. It is very clear that this T is in the stressed syllable. We don't say apply, in other words, we say apply. That P is strongly aspirated, mm. which must therefore indicate that it's initial in the syllable. 
Because if you've got something like stop lying, with a C, all right, stop, stop lying. You can hear how this P is not aspirated. It's probably glottally reinforced and so on. Stop lying. That sounds different. The L sounds different too. Apply, apply, apply. You've got to apply. Stop lying, stop lying. This L is voiceless. Apply. Why is that? It's because the P is aspirated, and the way you hear that aspiration is in the voicelessness of the following consonant, the L, or it would also apply to an R or a W or a Yod in that position. So it's very clear that the <coughs> P is in the stress zone. We hear that partly in the voicelessness of the L. What happens in the case of application? Well, the stress pattern is then application, double stress, main stress on the K. What about the P and the L? My rules now tell us that the P must go with the first syllable. The L can't because P, L is not a final cluster that's possible. Remember, this L is not a syllabic L. We're not talking about words like apple, where the L is a separate syllable. Um, P, L is a possible initial cluster, like please and so on, but it's not a possible final cluster in English. Therefore, the P goes to the A, but the L remains. And we're going to get to the fact that analysis. Application, application. Notice now, absence of aspiration, apply, application, application, voice to L. Apply, application. Apply, voiceless L. Application, voiced L. So this analysis in terms of syllables tells us, or gives us an explanation of some rather subtle phonetic differences that are to be observed if you listen very carefully to the way people pronounce it. <coughs> Last example we've got there, magnetic versus magnetism. What can we say about the T's in those two words? In magnetic, what happens to that T? Well, it's a syllable sort of final T. What will Americans do to it, therefore? Voice it, tapping it, magnetic, magnetic, American English, magnetic. What will Cockneys do to it? Well, we'll stop, magnetic, magnetic. <coughs> what about magnetism? Do Americans say magnetism? No, they don't. Do Cockneys say magnetism? No, they don't. I don't think so, anyhow. We've got a slight clash here of the morphology versus the uh, principle I've given you, but assuming that this principle wins out, the T is attracted into the is syllable, which is more strongly stressed, and therefore is initial and aspirated. Magnetism, certainly, where I said. All right. <clears throat> now we've got to tie up some loose ends. If, as I say, consonants are attracted into the more strongly stressed of the adjacent syllables, we've got to define what we mean by stress and how many levels of it there are and what is more than others and what's more than less. It seems to me we can recognize five degrees or levels of stress as they are set out here. Within a word, we've got, first of all, the primary stress, which is the main stress in a word. And you can identify this if you say a word in isolation by finding that the nuclear accent of the intonation will fall on that syllable. No problem there. Secondary stress, uh, which I see as being something that is pre-tonic, that is before the primary stress, which comes out in intonation as, a new, as a, an accent but not a nuclear accent. This is the sort of thing we had in these words like academic we were looking at yesterday. Academic. Two with the beats, academic. <coughs> if I wanted to say something like it's academic, I could do that. I could have a head on acca and a hypo nucleus on demic, or I could use some other combination. But it will always be some head on the acca bit and some nucleus on the dem bit. It's academic. So two potential accents, but the second one <coughs> is the nuclear one. So that's level two and level one. Level three is the case of tertiary stresses, which are possible stresses which are not normally accents. That's like the ism of magnetism or, in general, um, the uh, second part of a compound where the second part is polysynabic, as in a ball, rubber, the rubber accent there. No, no accent, just a possible stress. So that's tertiary stress. 
Level four is where we have a strong or full vowel, like the eight in, uh, what was the word we had? Um, annotate, compared with a reduced vowel, which is level five. A weak or reduced vowel. There is one problem that remains, five on the handout, that sometimes we get sequences of weak vowels, and the question is which way does the consonant between sequences of weak vowels go? <coughs> there are three words to exemplify T in this environment, carpeting. Primary stress on cop, nothing at all on it. Well, what we ask is what are the allophones of T used in this environment? Do we get aspiration? Can't be T, no we don't. Well, maybe that's not an answer because you wouldn't actually get aspiration before a weak vowel anyhow. Words like tomorrow tell us that. But do Londoners use glottal stops? Carpeting. Yes, they do. Do Americans use voice T? <coughs> Carbony. Yes, they do. So both the Londoners and the Americans clearly treat this T as belonging to the earlier rather than the later syllable. Somewhat surprising, perhaps. Covetous. Same applies. American covetous. Cockney, <laughs> Same applies in purity. American purity. Purity. Potentially tend to voice. Cockney, purity. Again, possibly a glottal stop. So, it seems to me to suggest that the T's in these certain places have to be treated as going earlier. <coughs> Slight digression now. Why have I been so worried about all of this? Well, it's really because of the Longman Pronunciation Dictionary. The publishers when we were discussing and planning the dictionary, said, you know, many users, potential users of the dictionary, find it very difficult to process great long strings of phonetic symbols, <coughs> because they're not used to phonetic symbols, and if you give them 10 or 15 <coughs> phonetic symbols for a long word, they're going to find it difficult to process. Wouldn't it be a good idea, we said, to break it up into syllables, then you can process them a syllable at a time. Wonderful idea. <coughs> okay, let's do that. <laughs> then, of course, I was immediately confronted with the necessity of finding a principled way to make syllable breaks in English words because we decided to print them as spaces, as you can see in the dictionary, spaces between syllables, but I must clearly have a, a principled, a thought-out way of making these breaks. And uh, I did quite a bit of experimentation, to be honest. I didn't start out with a ready-made theory. I look to see what books said and what other people said, and I tried to do it following Eric Fudge's view in his book about English word stress, which says that uh, anything that can be an initial consonant always is. I found this led to nonsense, uh, at least if I tried to predict the allophones that you get out of it. Then I tried various other ways, and eventually I arrived at this doctrine <coughs> because of this purely practical need I had to, to do it. And I've been right through the English vocabulary and done it for the English vocabulary. And as far as I can see, it gives all the right answers and no wrong answers. So I think it's a correct view. Right, now what are the uh, conditions that we have to apply there? Given on the second uh, part of the handout, number uh, <coughs> six, seven, eight. And um, three conditions, really. The first of these is what I call the morphine boundary condition. Morpheme boundaries, morphemes are the bits into word to which we can analyze words grammatically or lexically. And the point is that these morphemes are preserved intact on the whole in English. Consonants belonging to the syllable are appropriate to the morpheme of which they form, form a part. If we've got the word presuppose, the first one given here, you notice that the E in pre doesn't get prefortis clipped because the S that follows it is in a different morpheme. Presuppose is made up of pre plus suppose. The Germans can translate it as for us, destiny. And clearly the for corresponds to the pre, and uh, that's where there is a break. In priest, on the other hand, the S, T clearly must be in the same syllable. And the result is we get three forties clipping. And we do, as you can hear, priest priest, priest. And we don't say presuppose, we say presuppose. <coughs> a Roman bowman. A Roman comes from Rome. A bowman has a bow. Do these words rhyme? Well, they can in sort of 
fairly fast speech, but if you slow it right down and say them very deliberately, then they don't quite rhyme, because one is a Roman, a Roman, a Roman the noblest Roman of them all, and the other is a bowman, a bowman, an archer, a bowman. Similarly, there's a difference between a Norman from Normandy and a foreman who's in charge of things, a foreman. And the second example, third example given here, a bonus, that you play someone who works well, a bonus, a bonus versus slowness, the quality of being slow, slowness. Notice that English is such that many morpheme boundaries anyhow coincide with where I'm saying there's a syllable boundary. Big, bigger, morphologically big, uh, and by my rule, phonetically, big, uh. Oldest, same thing. Old plus ist, I'm predicting that anyhow the LD will be attracted into the first syllable because it's more strongly stressed. Putting, horses, zealous, scenic, all of those, I'm predicting a syllable boundary which will anyhow coincide with the morphine boundary. What is interesting is one or two cases where they clash. Awful. Now, you might think awful consists of all plus full. However, we don't say awful. We don't say what an awful noise. We say what an awful noise. Awful, awful. We get prefortis clipping, in other words, because of the air. Awful. And this corresponds to the fact that we don't think of awful as being connected with all. Now, historically, it was, of course, but by now it, it has a quite different meaning, nothing to do with solemnity but to do with just intensity or horribleness. Careful. Again, we don't say careful, though you might expect it. We say careful. It's such a familiar word, much more frequently used than care is, and it's therefore got lexicalized as one single item, and the F is in the first syllable. The man's name, or the surname, Dawson. Dawson. Well, etymologically, it's the son of uh, David, I suppose. But we don't say Dawson, we say Dawson. The S is in the first syllable. Benson is pretty obviously son of Ben, but we don't say Benson, we say Benson. And notice that people who epenthesize between N and S, like fencing, they say Benson. So that's further evidence, you see, in favor of this. Benson, yes. <coughs> There are some words where I had to really stop and think very carefully and introspect and ask my friends and so on to get this, the, the boundary right. What do we do with freedom? Now, there's no question of free quarters flipping because B is voiced. But my first reaction, introspecting, was that here the dum preserves its suffix nature and we say freedom rather than freedom. But I wasn't at all sure about it, and I forget what eventually I decided in the dictionary. Uh, there's also a problem with the F-O-R-D ending in names like Crawford. These are cases, in fact, where my research has suggested that native speakers vary. Some do one, some do the other. And all we can do is uh, choose one that seems suitable for foreigners or dictionary and face this thing. Uh, most people seem to say Crawford without prefortis clipping. No words that preserves its integrity. But some say Crawford with prefortis clipping. Well, these clearly are subtleties that probably are not in any way important in the language teaching classroom, but I tell you about them because they guide you my thought. Second on the handout, the phonotactic condition. Phonotactics means the study of the possible clusters we get in a language the possible initial consonant clusters, possible final consonant clusters. We're talking about phonotactics when we say that Japanese syllables have very different structure from English syllables. They don't have possible clusters except consonant plus yo, whereas English clearly does. We have things like SPR at the beginnings of syllables, words like spring. That is permitted by English phonotactics, but forbidden by Japanese tactics, or for that matter, Spanish tactics. Well, <coughs> it seems clear that we can't violate the ordinary tactics when we're making our syllable divisions. So with a word like timber, the B can't be in the first mm -hmm. syllable because MB is not a possible final cluster. Notice that words spelled MB like thumb, lamb, and so on, we don't pronounce any B. 
So the boundary has to be between M and B. Similarly, anger is ang plus g. But tender, ND is possible, words like stand and so on. So that can be ten plus er. Uh. Now look what happens when we consider the next law. Tumbler must be tum plus blur. That's the only way of dividing it unambiguously. Well, the only way of dividing it so as not to violate the text is English. But chandler, that must be charmed plus blur for two reasons. Because ND is possible, finally, stand, and because DL is not possible initially. We're talking always about RP here. I know there are certain differences in some other accents of English. Well, this looks super, except it gives us one or two residual problems. What about words like pleasure? Inasmuch as we neither have words beginning je nor words ending in je. Um, except borrowed words. Dr. Zhivago is borrowed with an initial je. We have rather more words borrowed with final je, words like camouflage, garage, and so on from French. And they're clearly more at home. Uh, and I plump, therefore, for pleasure plus er as being much easier to accept than a possible ple plus je, which would violate the general rule we don't get short vowels, finally, in a stressed syllable, which we don't otherwise. We don't get syllables ending like ple. And then there's the problem of the R's in words like bleary, sharing, sorry. Well, you can see that everything argues for their being in the stressed syllable. They are of the weak R type, not the strong R type. I don't live around them. It preserves the correspondence with the morphology in the first two words there. Uh, well, we know we don't get final R in English. That's because we, we lost it historically. We preserved it only before a vowel. Here, precisely, there is a vowel following, and it's parallel to the ones we preserved before a vowel. That's the linking R, the four apples type. So that's the analysis we have to make. And the last problem is the affricates. Uh, affricates, you remember, are things like tr, dr, ch, j. And the general rule we have to make here is that they are normally not split, but kept in the same syllable. This is obvious in cases like teacher, teacher plus er, courageous, ratchet, feature, merger. Less obvious in the case of words like petrol. People always finally home in on the word petrol, or some other example of this, because this is the most difficult thing in English syllabic notation. What do we do with the CR in petrol? It's an Africa. Well, if the if the break were pet, <coughs> so we have an impossible final short vowel, which we don't get in English. If the break is pet plus roll, we'd expect localization, pet roll, like you get in rat race and so on. Pet roll, we don't say that. So I conclude it must be pet plus o. That correctly predicts we get an affricate here. The problem is we don't have tr as a possible word final thing, do we? Well, of course, we do sometimes in phrases like, as a matter of fact, matter of fact, or oh, that's special. But I note also what happens to French names that we say in English, and not everybody, but it's really rather frequent to call him Sartre. All right, he's Sartre in, in French, but to call him Sartre in English, and similarly, the cathedral at Chartres. And the fact that we do this in foreign words is sort of evidence that it's available to us. Anyhow, this seems to me to be the uh, least bad solution of this difficult problem of Africans. That means we get petrol, mattress, squadron. That's perhaps not visible on your page. Uh, yes, it is. It's another line, isn't it? Squadron. Um, and uh, if we've got that, then we're forced to the remarkable conclusion that words like entry and sundry go the same way. Entry must have N-T-R all in the first syllable. Why? Because you do get pre-thought splitting, entry. You do get possible pre-glottalization, like in mattress, entry, which would not be expected if the break were elsewhere. If it were, for example, N plus tree, you'd expect it to be like in-tray in the last line. In-tray, where the tray is in the second syllable. And there's no pre thought splitting. That doesn't happen. So, really, rather to my own surprise, I found myself compelled to conclude that entry and wintry have a morphing boundary corresponding to a phonetic syllabification boundary, and all the consonants go in the first syllable. Thank you.